Day three of our coverage from Commodity Classic, and we are diving right back into the world of soy. We'll talk with the farmer leaders that are working to develop and build markets for the beans that you produce. Oh, and you guys should be here at the United Soybean Board booth. These guys are having so much fun. Live from the March to Springtime via Farm Journal broadcast, this is AgriTalk. This morning, it's a second sortie seeking satisfying soy specifics with the United Soybean Board. I'm oh. handsome newsman Davis Michelson, and now, coming to you from Commodity Classic in Balmy, Houston, Texas, the host of AgriTalk, Chip Flory. All right, Davis, hey, thank you so much. Yes, and welcome to Commodity Classic. Big thank you. To the United Soybean Board for making our coverage from Commodity Classic possible. You can learn more about USB and the investments that you are making in the future of the soybean industry at www.unitedsoybean.org. Dude, here we are, day three of coverage <laughs> from Commodity Classic. What do you make of that? If you're saying things like so much fun, yeah. uh, I yeah. think you're, yeah. you are having a good time down there. That's what oh, that I, translates to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm having a good time <laughs> and I'm learning a lot as we're doing it. It's uh, It's been fantastic. We had our early riser session this morning. Uh -huh. It was me, Chip Nellinger and Arlen Suderman on oh, wow. stage in Morgan yeah. for the taping of this weekend's U.S. Farm Report uh, panel. Great conversations there. Big crowd. And um, talked about a couple of things that, that I want to mention here real quick. We've got USDA Secretary... Tom Vilsack and EPA Secretary Administrator Regan mm. uh, that are here. Should and, be an, sounds like an announcement, maybe a foot, eh? Well, it is the the U.S. Department of Announcements. You do know that. So, <laughs> uh, but but here's the deal: everybody was expecting, and I mean everybody was expecting that that the combination of Vilsack and Regan. Yeah. would mean that we would get the announcement on the GREET model and how it would hopefully clear the path mm -hmm. for for ethanol to jet fuel mm -hmm. in, the, in the sustainable aviation fuel market. Uh, it sounds like that del that announcement is going to be delayed. At least that's what's being reported. Reuters really? reported it this morning. Uh, Jim Wiesmeyer uh, mm -hmm. it, it was, was on it as well. It's on the front page of Pro Farmer this week that uh, that the announcement is being delayed. Uh, instead, EPA is going to be announcing that uh, they're going to open up an office of rural affairs. Well, okay. I mean, that's got right. everybody very excited. Every, yeah. Everybody just could, no, nobody can believe that EPA is going to be opening up an office of rural affairs, and they're yeah. so excited that they brought brought both Vilsack and Regan to yeah. Commodity Classic in Houston, Texas, to mm -hmm. make that announcement. What whelming news, Chip? But yeah, yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? Just mm -hmm. fantastic. Anyway, anyway, the other thing that uh, that I want to hit here real quick yeah. for the 2024 crop year, the insurance, the spring price on corn, four dollars and sixty six cents a bushel, down mm -hmm. a buck and a quarter from last year. On soybeans, eleven fifty five, down two dollars and twenty one cents from last year. Yeah, six eighty four on spring wheat, down two oh three. So there we go. What else we got in the news? Well, we got the weather. Winter storms bring in heavy, higher elevation snow, widespread damaging winds and cold temperatures to much of the west. A powerful blizzard in the Sierra Nevada through this weekend. Widespread showers and thunderstorms across portions of the southeast and mid-Atlantic today. Much above average spring-like temperatures for the plains and Midwest once again heading into the weekend. Uh, meanwhile, a critical weather, uh, a fire weather threat for the central and southern high plains on Saturday. The wildfires continue, Chip. It is unbelievable the devastation that is happening in Texas. If you are in the path of one of those wildfires, good Lord. Yep. Um, uh, the, the damage that is being done and the cattle that have already been lost, yep. uh, it, it is a sad, sad situation, Davis. Well, Chip, the Senate voted 77 to 13 Thursday night to approve a short-term stopgap spending bill to extend government funding until March 8 for 20% of agencies, including USDA, and to March 22nd for the rest. You know, I'm not going to call it a can that they're kicking down the road anymore. It's a it, it's an oil barrel Ooh. that they are kicking down the road. Uh, it, it's unbelievable that we are dealing with 
um, the, the just an inability to get anything done, any decisions made. It's mm. crazy. What's up? California is grappling with the challenge of balancing the climate benefits of using crops to produce diesel fuel with the need to maintain adequate food supplies and stable prices. The state's low carbon fuel standard is undergoing potential revisions with a surge in renewable diesel production, triggering concerns about its impact on food markets. Environmentalists are urging limits on crop based fuels to prevent exacerbating hunger. Food versus fuel comes to California, Chip. Yeah, well, you know, let's let's figure it out. We can use it as food first and then turn it into fuel. Let, let's let's go down that path. Yeah. Well, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says seizing or monetizing two hundred eighty two billion dollars in frozen Russian assets to aid Ukraine cannot replace urgently needed assistance from Congress. Despite offers of financing from the European Union and Japan, the funding falls short of Ukraine's needs. Meanwhile, Ukraine is reportedly now conscripting farm workers in a desperate rush to bolster its military. Dairy margin coverage payments for January will be triggered due to the national average margin reaching uh, $8.48 per hundred weight. Farmers with coverage levels at $8.50, $9.50 will receive payments. Those will be processed after March 4. And uh, let's see, uh, finally, the CDC reports around 98% of the U.S. population has some form of immunity to COVID-19, whether through infection, vaccination, or both. Yeah. However, health experts caution, immunity provides only partial protection. Chip. All right. Hey, Davis, stick with me because I just got a text from Jim Wiesmeyer, pro-former policy analyst. Right on, right on. As it, I mean, I just got it. Biden administration says to finalize SAF climate model revisions within weeks. Uh, Reuters News is reporting uh. it. The Biden administration will finalize revisions to its climate model for sustainable aviation fuel feedstocks in the coming weeks. Uh, A White House official said the administration is committed to getting this right to both reflect the latest science and create new economic economic opportunities through SAF production and plan to finalize updates in the coming weeks. All I can say is if it was going to be good news for corn, wouldn't they make the announcement at Commodity Classic? One would think. One would think they would do that. Okay, we're going to have to deal with that later. Let's bring in Jennifer Scheich, uh, editor at Farm Drills Pork. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning. Hey, okay. Um, it, animal health, it's always a top priority. You were at the American Association of Swine Veterinarians. What did you learn? Well, I always learn so much there. I also often walk away feeling pretty uh, pretty dumb, but um, there's so <laughs> many great minds that um, come together and are really working on some tough things, but I think it was interesting. There was just a lot of really hard questions that were posed um, to the veterinarians. And and one of the big ones that was really talked about a lot was why haven't we eliminated PERS? Yeah. And so, you know, and then that follows up with as an industry, are we making progress in biosecurity? And I guess that was something that really stuck out to me because it seems like we're doing so many things and we are doing a lot of things. Um, we've made a lot of progress in the number of things we are doing and the knowledge that we have about it. However, if you measure the results of it, um, Daryl Holt Camp at Iowa um, State University's College of Vet Med said we have a long ways to go and we we need to do better. And we aren't making enough. So yeah. just it was really interesting. Lots yeah. of good things to think about. Yep, we need to make more progress on that. No question about it. Jennifer, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Get more on the story www.porkbusiness.com we are live at commodity classic thanks so much the united soybean board we're going to talk with the usb secretary philip good next you're listening to agritalk where the conversation begins join us at 855-4-TALK-AG and welcome back to AgriTalk. We are live at Commodity Classic down in Houston, Texas. Big thanks to the United Soybean Board for making it possible. Uh, learn more about uh, USB at www.unitedsoybean.org. Joining us now, Philip Good, USB Secretary. Philip, it's great to talk with you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, glad that you're here. Where are you from? Tell me about your operation. Sure. I'm from Macon, Mississippi. Okay. Uh, East Central um, farm soybeans, corn, cotton, cattle, and catfish. Cattle? You still are in the catfish? Still am. Still am. Sure. 
Holy smokes. Yeah, I, I, it's one of my favorite stories that I've ever done, Philip, to be honest with you, is going down and taking a look at at uh, the catfish farming. And and not only that, what uh, what some of the, the conservation efforts to turn those expired catfish farms into some some uh, recreational habitat. And boy, oh boy, what's going on down in that area is pretty amazing to me. It is. Um, we get the privilege of capturing some of our winter runoff rain and, yep. and capture that and put those into our catfish ponds and of course feed them some very nutritious soy yeah i and we talk about promoting and using what you're uh, what you're out promoting and what you're producing good grief uh, the the amount of soy that goes into fish farming is it's pretty incredible, isn't it? And it's growing around the world as well. Yeah. So yeah, the feed conversion, the feed efficiency of of aquaculture is absolutely amazing. It's a great protein source. And it tastes darn good. Yes, it does. And it's good for you. It's good for you. That's right. That's right. Okay. Let's talk about a couple of things here. And, and I want to start with the C for Yourself program, Philip. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, um, I had the opportunity to lead a group of farmers um, that are just up and coming leaders in their communities and in their states. Mm -hmm. We had the opportunity to go to Central America, to Panama and Colombia. Uh, in Panama, we were able to see something that's been on my bucket list to see the Panama Canal. Yeah. And then we went on from there to Colombia. You know, uh, when I was last year in New Orleans, I had the opportunity when we were there looking at the Mississippi River and the dredging projects that USB has funded, saw a ship that was being loaded for Central America. It was being loaded with soybean meal. Mm -hmm. So now I had the opportunity, along with all these other farmer participants, to see, you know, where that soybean meal was going. Yeah. And so while we were there, we had the opportunity to see um, aquaculture operations with raceway systems where some of the greatest and latest technology with great feed efficiency, um, feeding high nutritious soy in their diets. Uh, we then were able to see uh, a fish processing plant mm -hmm. in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, we were able to go to Grupo Bios where we saw the feed being made. And so it was just an outstanding opportunity. And I never thought as a U.S. farmer that rain in Panama would even matter right. me in my operation. I worry about rain on my farm, but to go there and to see that the shortage of rainfall in Panama mm -hmm. is actually affecting infrastructure and freight costs for the world. Yeah. That was that was really something to see, infrastructure around the world. Yeah, I, I, the amount of money that that drought is adding, uh, the cost that it's adding to move our product around the world, it's, it's unbelievable right now. Somebody's got to pay the bill on that. Right, and there's only, you know, so the Panama, the lake there is the the water source for the people yeah. there of Panama. And so they're, they're worried um, and are hoping for more rain. And so that is all uh, making a difference. So ships that aren't being able to go through the Panama Canal are having to go the farther distance, go down and around. It's adding to freight costs. Yeah. So these farmers, these new leaders that are coming yeah. into USB, when they do see it for themselves for the first time, what's their reaction? Oh, it was exciting to see because, um, you know, like on the way home uh, on the, in the airports, uh, they were telling the story. They were going up to people. They were they they had. um it was not a vacation by any means. Right. Uh, it was a trip that's that was just something they will not forget. Uh, they learned, they shared, and that was the whole purpose to see our USB investments around the world, what we're able to do and help the people of Panama and Colombia. That is just super cool. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. And to have the understanding that what you saw is being duplicated and replicated in many countries around the world, all in an effort to build demand for U.S. soy, that's got to be pretty exciting to be part of it. It is. And we actually heard a story from one individual that that just it just made chills go up my spine. And that is because what they are able to do with aquaculture and with some of these young uh, and some of the single women, mm -hmm. it is helping to save and turn around their lives from the unthinkable. Right. Right. That's Absolutely. Cool. Very cool. It, it very much is cool. Yeah. Talk to me about the life cycle assessment. Uh, what are what are some of the interesting findings that you've got there? Well, um, there's a news press release coming just very shortly okay. here 
Something we're very excited about is the report shows that there's a 19% decrease in our carbon footprint. So yeah. for all of us farmers, I think, you know, we are passionate about the soil. We are passionate about sustainability. For myself, when I was just young and starting farmer, you know, just, just starting out my career, uh, my dad said to me, you know, son, your soil, this farm is your future. It is like a bank account. Yep. You have to make more deposits than you do withdrawals. And that is something that is just as true today as it was then. Yeah. So we're passionate about the soil. We know it's our future. We know it's there for the future generation. So what we're doing today, whether it be cover crops, whether it be precision agriculture, whether it be whatever it is, um, we're helping to make that so. And so um, this report shows that from 2015 to 2021, a 19% decrease in the carbon footprint for soybeans. And since that time, with the greater, uh, you know, uh, the greater recognition of the uh, of the efforts that are underway, I mean, there's got to be more progress that, that's going to be reported not to not too long from now right oh that was in 2021 right here we are in 2024 right and it, it the yeah it's it's continuing to progress right right and the message is out the message is out the uh the i i don't know if we've got uh 100 buy-in among producers out there but it's getting closer all the time isn't it it is and it's something that the farmers we all know what we're doing uh we maybe even take it for granted. Yeah. But what this number reflection shows to the general public is it's actually showing the scientific numbers behind what we're actually doing and passionate about. Right. Right. Gotcha. Very cool. Very cool. Another one, Farmers for Soil Health Program. Yeah. Uh, cover crops. Cover crops are something we're able to partner uh, in this. And, and as, and as a, a USB director, we love to partner with with whoever it may be. Um, okay. And so in this program, um, it's able to provide an income uh, or a cash flow for farmers who are willing to adapt cover crops. Um, if you've been doing cover crops, there's a $2 one-time uh, payment in there. Okay. And if not, uh, you can earn up to $50 over three years to just implement cover crops. I know in my operation, um, after we do uh, the minimum tillage that we do in the fall, uh, when we plant a cover crop, it is a perfect protection for that dirt, for that soil, um, and a filter for the water that we collect in our reservoirs for yeah. later irrigation in the summer. Yeah, yeah. And I, when you think about cover crops, see, I'm up in northeast Iowa. I think about the cover crops on the hills mm -hmm, and everything. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're probably worried about a whole lot of uh, of hills down in Mississippi, are you? No, we're not worried about hills. Right. We receive a lot of winter rain. Right. And so our problem is we get excess in the winter, but not enough when we need it in the summer. Yeah. So what we're able to do is filter that with our cover crops, put it into the reservoirs. So all the rainfall that falls on my farm captured in a reservoir and then spread out by center pivots in the summer. Yeah. So for us, this is just it's a perfect fit um, and it's an opportunity for cash flow. I do want to say that as a farmer, if you have not signed up yet, you still have time. March the 15th is an upcoming deadline. Okay. So you've still got time if you're a farmer to invest, you know, to sign up and, and get this uh, cash flow coming your way to help you with with cover crops. At least look into it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's what have you got to lose? Tool belt. Yeah. What have you got to lose to, to just take a look at it and see what the program might offer? Less than a minute left. Being in a leadership role at USB, what does that mean to you? I have the opportunity to work and serve with some of the top farmers around the United States. Yeah. I have learned so much from them, the relationships, but what for me is very cool is being able to see the investments, the projects that we are able to invest in and to, um, yeah, to just further and enhance diets, nutrition, food around the world. Uh, uh, that is so cool. That is very cool. Yeah. And improve it. it it just enhanced the livelihoods of, of people around the world. As you were talking about getting some of the, the women involved in agriculture and showing them the way on how they can be involved in, in, in farming and, and providing food for their communities. It's got to be very rewarding. And at the very end, we're bringing value back to the U S soybean farmer. That Fantastic. is what our whole purpose is here. And so, yeah, we're, we're raising the bar. 
Fantastic. Philip, thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you. You bet. That is Philip Good. He is the United Soybean Board Secretary. When we come back, we're going to continue the conversation with the USB Vice Chair, Ed, Ed Lammert. Time for Markets Now with the experts from Pro Farmer. Joining us now, Pro Farmer Editor Brian Grady Beach. I We've got some mixed trade going on in the grain markets, but we better start with what's happening in wheat. Yeah, uh, you know, just a, a breakdown here, Chip. Uh, yep. Double-digit losses uh, across all three of the, the markets, so SRW, HRW, and, and spring wheat futures. And, and uh, uh, winter wheat's leading to the downside. And, and, you know, wheat has performed better than, than corn and soybeans. We've talked about that. Yep. Um, but just, you know, kind of just stuck in neutral here and grinding and, and uh, not really – you know, able to find any kind of uh, sustained buyer interest. Yeah, the pressure on wheat looks like it's spilling over to the corn market. Yeah, five to six cents lower here at mid morning, so we're starting to see seller pressure, selling pressure uh, accelerate a little bit, uh, pulling back on, on some of those corrective gains that we posted earlier in the week. All right, mixed trade in the soy complex. Yeah, so meal, we've talked about that. Uh, it's trading to the upside, which is supporting old crop uh, soybean futures. Uh, the new crop soybeans are, are mildly weaker at the moment. Gotcha. All right. Over in the livestock trade, we've got some gains in the live in in uh, the cattle complex. What's happening? Yeah, both uh, live cattle futures and feeders uh, trading sharply to the upside. So we faced uh, some selling pressure earlier in the week and uh, recouping some of that here as we close out the week. Uh, uh, you know, really, it was nothing more than than just a, a technical pullback early in the week, and, and uh, like I said, we're regaining some of that. And, and yep. it looks like cash cattle trade is going to be about steady when all said and done. And, and so that's uh, probably better than what was anticipated yeah. at, at one point this week. And then hog futures mildly weaker here at mid-morning. Yeah, not a whole lot going on in hogs. Brian, thank you so much. That is Pro Farmer Editor Brian Grady on Markets Now. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. On your favorite radio station or your preferred digital device, AgriTalk is live every weekday. Welcome back to AgriTalk and Commodity Classic down in Houston, Texas. Big thank you to United Soybean Board for making it possible for us to bring you coverage from Houston. Uh, joining us now is the USB Vice Chair, Ed Lammers. Ed, it's great to see you. How are you? Good morning, Chip. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, the atmosphere here on the trade show floor is going to change dramatically here in about uh, the next couple of minutes because the trading show is is uh, opening up for the day here. Correct. What? It's been a a good show so far. Yes, hasn't it, it has. There's a lot of excitement. You know, we've got a uh, new technologies, new uh, equipment, and just information, right? Yeah, great yeah. information. You know, and the commitment of bringing information to this show is tenfold what it was ten years ago, and it, it's the lineup is impressive. Yeah, it takes a lot of uh, collaboration, right? And yeah. I, I, first, I want to say thanks to you, Chip, for what you do. I mean, uh, your integrity and your professionalism, sharing information to U.S. producers, you yeah. know, whether it's corn, soybean, animal ag, whatever that be. Thank you. For oh, doing thank that. you. I and appreciate yeah, so uh, this collaboration of a lot of partners that um, it's an education series, right, yeah. for, for everybody that wants to come and be involved. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So where's your operation, Ed? Uh, very Northeast part of Nebraska. I'm a fifth generation farmer. So um, yeah, we have a rotational crop. Uh, we're going to start growing a little cover crop seed okay. this year because uh, uh, I feel um, well with uh, the economics of some of our row crop systems that um, there might be an opportunity there in that uh, um, cover crop seed arena. So gotcha. Gotcha. Um, we're going to look into that. We're going to uh, designate an area for that. Uh, I have my sons involved. We also have a, a 200 head cow calf that we uh, take those calves from birth to market. And my son's been a big part of that coming back to the farm and selling that 
privately um, and, and making that a business. And oh, direct to consumer. Yes, on the it's, it's a great asset. I mean, it's something I never thought about it, and it, it, it uh, uh, makes it available for him another source of income available for yeah. him to make it work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so. you know, we talk about the need for regional and and local yes. processors all the time. If you yeah. can do, who? If you yeah. if you can butcher and process and and uh, and deliver a couple hundred head of of beef cattle every year to your your consumers, that's good stuff. Absolutely, we get a chance to give tell our story also. Yeah, and there's a little bit of corn and meal that goes with it too, isn't <laughs> yes, there? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. All right. Um, talk to me about the priorities of USB and and specifically. Uh, <laughs> We, we look at the amount of competition that is happening around the globe right now. How do we get consumers around the globe to choose U.S. beans? That's a great question. So I think um, back to, uh, you know, your uh, professionalism, telling our story, you know, so it, it relates to all back to how we can present our story. Well, it's sustainability characteristics, uh, a reliable, safe product, logistically wise. There's just a lot of different pieces to that puzzle that we need to come together and make a group effort to go in a certain direction. Now, our priority areas uh, and our strategic plan really kind of help focus those areas. And then we have a, a certain groups of farmers from different regions of the United States mm -hmm. coming up with ideas of what they foresee in the future to help us come to that uh, outcome that we want, you know, right. make sure U.S. soy is always the preferred soybean or yeah. soybean meal. You know, the sustainability story that we can tell from farming and, and you've mentioned cover crops and expansion in the cover crop program and everything, but there are existing stories that we can tell and it all adds to the sustainability of the business. The conversations that we had here yesterday, it's important to those customers in Asia that we can that, that there is a story of sustainability that comes along with U.S. soybeans, right? Yes, exactly. And, and not only that story, but the importance of us taking care of that soil. I think Philip hit it pretty well. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, that, you know, we need to pay attention to that because we need to put in the deposits to take them out. Or, yep. And uh, organic matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yep. Organic yep. matter or even anything we can do just to make sure that next generation, maybe, or I'm hopeful we'll be 10 generations of being sure. on the farm, right? Right. I'm in a very lucky spot to be number five. My son's number six. He's yep. got a grandson. So whatever we can do now yep, and educate ourselves and other producers to make sure that's available. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love the story that you're telling there on the sustainability side. And it's not just, it, it it's... It's the most important thing that we have in agriculture is the ground that we produce with. And to ignore that fact seems silly to me. Totally agree. I mean, it's been a staple in my um, yeah. um, participation in the United Soybean Board. All right. One of the it, it, infrastructure and our ability to move product around the country and out of the country wow. has always been a, a, a focus for us. But it's not like we can just let it happen and it and it happens automatically. We got to work at it, don't we? No doubt. It's very easy to become complacent when everything's yes. working, correct? Yes. And then we have all these disruptors coming at us where uh, we never really considered, right? Uh, uh, water being low on the Panama Canal, I just never. Yeah. And then the Suez Canal, and and you can go to Lower Mississippi, and and. Yeah. So we, well, United Soybean Board has invested in, in a couple of those projects for the infrastructure to make sure that there's a opportunity to move our products, whether it's going through the, the upper lakes at, at um, the St. Lawrence. Yeah. St. Lawrence or, Seaway. Or the uh, Lock and Dam at 25. Yeah. yeah. So we're doing some work there just to make sure we're trying to see, a, a, trying to look at that vision of what may happen if we don't do that mm -hmm. and trying to stay ahead of things. So, yeah, it is complicated, but, you know, the attempt is being made. Yeah, it's been an advantage. And, and that advantage in many ways is being challenged or reduced because of some of the progress that's being made in Brazil and Argentina. We at least got to try to keep up. Oh, I want to stay ahead. Yes. <laughs> Amen so to that. I want to stay ahead. But yeah, and so that's that's kind of that process where we need yeah. to look forward ahead, 
far enough ahead yep. to stay ahead. Yep. So. All right. Um, in in, uh, in farming, we're always making sure that if you're spending a dollar, you're getting a couple of dollars back. Yep. Um, the the same is true for the checkoff funds that are coming to USB. What kind of value does does the checkoff fund bring to U.S. soybean farmers? Well, we've done a study here in the past, and and that uh, we're going to upgrade. We're going to do a new study. It's going to be coming out here shortly, but um, and we're at the end of the year actually. But our return of investment right now for every dollar of checkoff dollars that's being paid put into USB is a uh, twelve dollars and thirty four cents return. Right. Pretty remarkable. Yep. Pretty remarkable. Now that does get broke down to different categories, and I don't have that information right, right in front of me. But it's overall the average is one to twelve. This is not a number that you're kind of spitballing with. This is no. an audited, proven number. That is correct. That is correct. Done at uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the university, but Dr. Yep. Kaiser's kind of the guy that's been doing it. He right. did it last year, and he's doing it again this year. Yeah, I shouldn't say last year, but five years. Right, ago. but. It, it, the, the return is there. The return yeah. is real. It is. It is. I mean, come down to our booth. Yeah. This is just a, there's a lot of displays that are showing that. Yeah. And, the, and our team here has done a great job doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so when we think about the future of the industry, uh, technology is going to be a big part of it. Uh, what kind of technological advancements are being made with soybeans? Well, how do we play a role? Oh, wow. Um, many ways, um, new innovation. Um, uh, so uh, new uses, you know, yeah. we're in tires or in asphalt, we're in uh, uh, biofuels and, and fire extinguishers. Yeah. Ain't that exciting. How cool is uh, that? Uh, gold standard. There's only one gold standard in fire uh, extinguishing material. And soy's got it. And really? soy's in it. Yes. I just found that out here like a week ago. And it's so. soybean meal that's part of it. Yes, it yeah. is. And the fire uh, fire uh, engines and the people, the team out there, they want that. Mm -hmm. And how cool is that, Chip? Yeah, oh, it's I incredible. Mean, you, you're in, a, in the building step of that. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's a pull market. Yep. People want it. That's yep. exciting. So there's a lot of things going on and we'll continue like bioplastics. That's another avenue that we're looking into. And, and you know, those landfills are not getting any smaller, man. That's right. You know, the thing that impresses me about this is that it would be so easy to look at what's happening with renewable diesel and with sustainable aviation fuel and just kind of say, that's enough. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to let that handle it from here, but you're not it, continue to look for new uses. That's the great thing about the leadership at USB. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's programmed into us. We yeah. would never be complacent, never be satisfied. Right. Right. Let's right. Keep moving forward. Exactly. What does it mean to you to be a leader at USB? Wow. Um, you know, I thought about that quite a bit. And um, number one is the relationships, the opportunity to build up relation or build relationships with fellow farmers from you throughout the United States. Yeah. Right. Everybody's got an opinion, but the goal is to come up with the direction of USB. And without that, it, and in that, there's so much growth, right? Yeah. You learn how to uh, communicate. You know, I'm out there in Nebraska. Well, there's not a whole lot of people. So that's just one <laughs> thing I'm learning to communicate a little better, but also to make a plan together with a huge region. Yeah. Right? Whether it's in soil health or whether it's in, uh, you know, transportation of you know, not only are uh, products going out, but what needs to come in, yeah. right? Yep. So a lot of puzzles uh, and trying to put that piece together or that puzzle together yeah. and uh, coming up with that plan. So, and fantastic. the other thing is I, I just love the long range thinking. Good, good, because we got to think long range. There's yes, no sir. doubt. Ed, thank you so much for making time. You, you bet Ed Lammers, he is the USB Vice Chair. Okay, we are going to take a quick break, and then we're going to wrap up our coverage from USB with Brent Gatton, the USB treasurer. When news breaks, the newsmakers talk about it on AgriTalk with Chip Flory. Welcome back to AgriTalk and Commodity Classic and Houston Tech. Big thanks to USB. Uh, for sponsoring two days, two morning shows 
uh, down here at Commodity Classics so that we can dive into the world of soy. And we're going to keep the conversation going. We've got Brent Gatton. He is the USB treasurer and joins us right now. Brent, it's great to talk with you. How are you? Doing good. Thank you for having me today. Tell me about the operation. Where are you located? I'm located in western Kentucky, a little town called Bremen, Kentucky. So we, right. we grow corn and soybeans, and I'm a fifth generation, first off. I have three okay. three young sons. I have twins that are 13, and I have an older one that's 15. So it's Wyatt, Will, and Reed, and I farm there with them and my wife, Kim. All right. And we actually have a country ham business on our farm as well that my granddad started selling uh, hams commercially back in the 60s. So we cure ham, bacon, and sausage. So. I'll bet it's delicious. You might, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to get you some. Yeah, so. <laughs> go, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. We we will talk. All right. We will talk. And again, again, it's like we were talking about with Ed. I, I, you're, you're moving the product that you're growing in the field, moving it through the hogs into the hams and yes, out to the consumers. It's it's part of the process. Yes. Yep. So it's pretty talk about skin in the game. That's right. Yes. It's pretty amazing that we can, we can grow a crop and then we can see an end product at the end, whenever we sell those country hams, you know, all over the United States and so, smiles on faces when they pick them up. That's right. You can definitely smell it when you cook it in the house. That's what I tell people. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I love it. I love it. USB treasure. Okay, talk to me about the investments that you're excited about. You know, we're super excited. Back in uh, July of last year, we approved the FY24 budget. So right now, our physical year starts October 1. So we're about five months into FY24. Okay. And we're super excited. You know, we did, we've we done some infrastructure studies and things like that to how we can increase meal shipment south the West Coast. Yep. So like the Port of Grays Harbor, you know, we've by those studies and those infrastructure improvements at the port, we've been able to increase our export exports from 3 million metric tons to 6 million metric yeah. tons to our South Asian, Asian customers, you know, yeah. so that that's super exciting. Uh, another one is the biofuel, you know, how much in demand it is, you know, so now we're, we're, we're coming up with new ways and trying to invest in research and things like that to be able to find a way to uh, get higher meal usages that they, yep. through poultry feed and other livestock diets and things like that. Like you talked with our vice chair, Ed, earlier about the firefighter phone. We're excited yeah. about that. And yeah. and we also have the in Soy Innovation Challenge of where we've got, we're putting out um, hmm. kind of a prize, I guess you would call it, for in, people that can come up with new innovative ways to be able to help us move that pile, yeah. move the soybean meal. Yeah. You know, so. Yep. You know, you, you mentioned the biofuel sides and the renewable diesel and the sustainable aviation fuel yeah. and how it... We know that that is going to be a major disruption to the way that we've always done business, but it's a heck of an opportunity too. Yes. And what's encouraging to me is it, it's like I was talking about earlier. It would be simple to say, look at what biofuels are doing for us. Let's, let's just kind of focus on that. You've got to focus on all aspects, including what are we going to do with the soybean meal? Yes, yes. We've got to include the whole bean in that discussion. Yes. So we're super excited at USB. You know, right now we're actually in our FY25 build out of our portfolios. So what it is, we have 77 directors on the board. We actually have three priority working groups, which would be in infrastructure connectivity, health and nutrition, and innovation and technology. These farmers get in these different work groups, and they're focusing either on the supply side or the demand side and trying to figure out ways and collaborate and put together a wish list of how we can invest these checkoff dollars through education, research, and promotion to be able to move that pile through whatever yeah. it's through, you know, soybean meal, the whole bean, you know, so we're just... It's exciting to see all farmers come together and think as a as what will benefit all farmers across the United States, not just in their local areas. Fantastic. Fantastic. And we were talking about this a little bit in the last segment with Ed. But there is a there is a return on the investment of these checkoff dollars. Yes. Yes. You know, talk like, to me about it. Yes, like Ed spoke earlier, you know, for every dollar we spend, we get twelve dollars and thirty-four cents back yep. in return. You know, to me, that is just an amazing amount of return. And and that that study is done. That's a required, it's a USDA requirement through the checkoff. Yep. And so that's done through yep. the audit and evaluation committee. So as of this year, we're actually having to do another new study. So that information will probably be out later on this year to see where those numbers are lying at. But you know, I don't know any farmer that's going to complain about spending a dollar and getting that twelve thirty-four back in return, you know. Yeah. So I can truly see that the checkoff works on behalf of behalf of all farmers just imagine what where we would be at today's markets you know prices have fallen ever since the combines have stopped rolling it seems yep. like and on the being treasurer i can kind of see the collection process and right now we're down a little bit on collections but you can see a lot of farmer holding right now yep. you can kind of see where that storage you know we, that's, that's the difference between us and our south american partners you know they have to take their their product yep. straight straight to the to the port for exports, right. you know, and I, you can see there's a lot of crops still being held on farms as of right now, but we're on track to make budget and, you know, through some investments and interest investments that we've made, you know, we have plenty of, uh, 
plenty of checkoff funds yeah. coming in to be able to support our FY25 budget that the board will vote on in July. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. Uh, before you, we got on, we were talking about the partnerships out there. One of the of best partnerships that I see is between the ASA, uh, USB, and the U.S. Soybean Export Council. Mm -hmm. That relationship with USEC is really important. Oh, it is. I tell you what, it's amazing. That I'm just so honored to be a part of the program that the 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 farmers that seemed to get this checkoff started back in 1991 were able to have the foresight to come together to 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 form these organizations right. to work on our behalf. You know, so we're all we're all in this together. We're all serving a common goal, a common purpose. But you know, we can't use checkoff dollars for lobbying uh, things, and so that's what ASA's there for. They're yeah. they're there to protect the farmers' rights on their way to farm and advocate on our behalf. And we're on the checkoff side to promote. To promote exports with USEC and individuals like that, USEC, USMEF, USAPEAK. And it's just amazing that all the work that all these organizations do on behalf of our farmers. You guys are so good about sticking USMEF in there every yes. time. Yes. Because of the, the, the product that's being exported through the meats. Yes. Yes. You know, I tell you what, the number one, con the number one consumer yeah. and our number one co com customer for the United Soybean growers are our poultry industry, right. our livestock markets, you know, so thank goodness for that. So, yeah. Right. So yeah, no hand doubt about hand. it. Um, real, real quick, past chairs are here. Yes. You're honoring the past yes. and the decisions that they've made that got USB to the point that it is right now. I think yes. it's really cool that you guys are doing that. Yeah. It, it is such an honor to be able to network and enter and, and learn from these individuals of how we got to where we're at. You know, yeah. I, I'm a big believer, and you got to learn where you come from to know where you're going to go next. And these individuals and the history and the knowledge these individuals have. I hope that continues that relationship that USB can have with the past chairs to come to they come to some of our board meetings yep. and it's very special to have them here at the body classic. Brent, great conversation, my friend. Thank yes, you. All right, thank you. All right, that is Brett Ganton. He is the USB treasurer. Davis, that's wrapping up our coverage from USB. Uh, yeah, man. You gotta come back this afternoon, though. We're gonna have a conversation. This guy called Oliver Slope. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna be on with us. And Tommy Grasafi, we're continuing the conversation that we had last week on Friday. We're going to continue it today at the BASF booth from Sometimes Life is Wonderful.